Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dwight here with Auction Up YouTube channel. Got an exciting video for you guys today. I want to talk about a Waterford Crystal um, vase that I sold. It was pretty dang big and heavy. It was an awesome find. Um, I want to talk to you about, I don't know, a bunch of crap. A bunch of cool vintage crap, you know what I mean? You have to have a good eye for vintage stuff and antiques. And if you appreciate it, then you should appreciate this channel. So make sure you take a moment, hit that like button, and while you're at it, subscribe. That way you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. And here's a bonus. Every time you give me a like, it's like a blessing. Why? Because then YouTube will bless my channel with more traffic. And it's just, it's great. We'll all grow together. Our knowledge will grow together. The community will grow together. Channel will grow. Anyway, all right, guys. Um, for all of you that took time right now to hit that like button, thank you. All right, so let's just dive right into this, guys. Um, so this a few days ago. I brought it, I've had this in my, um, I've actually had this in my inventory for about, for um, somewhere between six and four months. Um, it's a Waterford uh, Broquet, Broquet, I can't say it properly, vase, large, nine-inch crystal diamond wedge, uh, cut, uh, cut classic. Uh, this bad boy was pretty dang big, guys. It was big, and it was heavy. Now, when I say big, it wasn't ridiculous, but just give you an idea, the box was like this big that it was in. Uh-oh, look like an idiot. But anyway, it says nine inches. Nine inches isn't small. Here's a roller right here beside me that I use for taking pictures all the time. So, you know what I mean? Not, it, it wasn't small, but anyway. Um, sold this for $135, $17.50 shipping, and, um, let's, let's take a dive, I don't really, let's take a dive into what, what do you really know about Waterford Crystal? You may know they exist, but what do you really know about them? So let's take a dive into it. Here's some brief history of Waterford Crystal. All right, Waterford Crystal was founded in 1783 in Waterford, Ireland. It, it started as a glass manufacturing company called the Waterford Flint Glass Company. In the 1940s, it pioneered the development of lead crystal production techniques. Lead crystal has a high lead oxide content, which makes the glass sparkle more brilliantly. Didn't know that. Um, by the 1950s, the Waterford Crystal had established itself as a premier crystal brand known for its fine craftsmanship and beautiful designs. Many of its pieces were hand-blown and hand-cut. Some notable designs over the years include the Lismore pattern introduced in 1952, which is still popular today with its diamond, uh, diamond and wedge cuts. Other famous cuts include the Galloway and the Colleen patterns. Okay. Um, Waterford Crystal has crafted pieces like chandeliers, vases, stemware, and other tableware items. It's made... Um, custom pieces for special events and clients like Heads of State, the Vatican, and the White House. The company changed names a few times over the decades, but has retained its Waterford Crystal branding. It went through some turbulent times, but managed to survive and rebuild. Today, Waterford Crystal continues to produce prestigious crystal pieces combining traditional techniques and modern technology. So it's pretty cool. I mean, that company has been around for a long time. 1783. It's pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, you run across these items at auctions, estate sales, uh, Goodwill, drift shops, and, um, it's just cool to know the actual history behind Waterford Crystal, and what, like, I'm a reseller, of course, and there's a link to my, my, um, stores actually below, Etsy and eBay, if you want to check it out, after you watch this video, but, um, it's just really cool to know the history behind Waterford, you know what I mean, like, I know it exists, I know it's old, I know it's crystal, but I don't really know the history behind it, all right. Didn't know the history about the next thing either. Here we go. Where is it at? Okay. This is a, um, what is this? A vintage toll paint by number uh, metal tray. Um, I brought this. I got it. This was like a really cheap find. As you can see there, I sold it for like $18.70. Uh, I paid a dollar for it. But um, this tray here, I did the history behind it. It's pretty cool though. Um, so, And I always do good with trays. I don't know why. Trays sell. The old black, black flowers whatever you find on them they sell they just do um here are some key details all right toll painting refers to decorative folk art painting done on a metal trays and other objects tin and copper were commonly used metal metals paint by number kits for toll painting on metal emerged in the 1950s slash 60s as a popular craft hobby in america Major companies included Palmer, Craftmaster, and Concepts. I do not know who created this tray, who manufactured this tray. Common vintage toll painted designs include nostalgic or nautical uh, scenes like ships, 
boats, lighthouses, seas and seascapes. These were rendered in simple numbered regions for hobbyists to fill in. As you can see, you look at this tray here. Um, yeah, it's pretty stuff. Look, it's, I kind of thought it was cool because I knew what it was meant for, and but I didn't know the way that the, the scenes were numbered. And I, I don't know. I just found it really cool. It's like a coloring book almost for adults. <laughs> uh, metal tray sizes range from six six by eight inches to large trays over two feet long. Ten was lighter weight, but copper gave more polished finish uh, when completed. Painted by number trays was mass produced very affordably, making the hobby widespread in the mid 20th century. They were sold in craft catalogs and, and stores. Many vintage toll trays today feature in um what many toll trays today are uh, basic but cheerful folk art charm with primitive colorful boat and harbor scenes. And here that's definitely a boat and potentially a harbor scene. Um let's see what else I got here. More intricately detailed custom toll trays can also be found dating from the 50s and 70s. These were often painted by skilled artisans not using basic paint by number uh, kits. Uh, collectors today seek out high quality vintage toll trays in good condition with appeal stemming from nostalgic, uh, I don't know, from nostalgic coastal designs and American folk art traditions. So yeah, this is a toll tray. Um, that's really interesting and understand the history behind it and the the really intricate ones i always they always sell they every time and um they're a little hard to ship because of the size but um yeah i just thought this was an awesome find it might be a ruler on this tray sometimes i throw a ruler there we go it gives you an idea of the size of that tray there all right the next product up then all these just sold this week by the way all right the next product that just sold this week was this right here let me jump over here real quick. No, back away. All right. It's a vintage 1941 Collier's World Atlas and Gazette hardcover uh, color maps. Um, yeah, I love these. I, I just love the old um, atlases, honestly. Let's see. This one, I believe, is from 1941, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, 1941. And I don't know. They're just awesome. And, yeah. Every time I see one, I snatch them up. I can't help myself. But um, it's... Let's take a look at Colliers right here. All right, let's jump into it. All right, Colliers uh, publisher, P.F. Collier and Sun Corporation, originally published in 1957 with multiple revised editions printed through the 1960s and 70s. Wait a minute. This is from 1941. They must have changed their name. Yeah, they changed his name. This is going to be wrong. The information here is wrong. Anyway, I should have double... I should... Well... I'm brand new to this, so I'm going to have to, you know, read before I jump into the information I find and make sure it's accurate. Sorry. But anyway, um, yeah, so this one sold for uh, $21.25, and, you know, it was just, just a real cool piece of history. And it's not a small atlas at all. It, it takes up some size. So it may look small, but this bad boy is not small. I wish I had a picture of my hand holding it, give you an idea, a reference of death. But anyway... Um, so yeah, that was a really cool um, sale there, and yeah, these are also up like any kind of old maps, vintage gas station maps. They're awesome, um, especially when you get the ones back to like the forties, thirties. Definitely had brought purchased some from the forties before. Um, globes, globes are great too. A little tricky to find. It's kind of hard to know the good ones from the bad ones sometimes. But yeah, globes, are, world globes are awesome. All right, let's jump on over. This is a goofy one here. A VCR, but what do you really know behind this VCR, guys? And you look at the price, you like they paid what? VCRs are collectible now. What, what, I mean, what can you say? They um, the hard, yeah, they, they don't match if they don't manufacture them yet. They say they keep re remanufacturing everything, but they have not started to reproduce these yet. But yeah, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. But um, the videotapes. One thing I've learned is videotapes are not last into the test of time the uh tape seems to be dry rotted dry rotting more often when you come across them so something to keep in mind if it weren't kept in perfect conditions those tapes do not last but uh let's dive into the vcr real quick here i, just, I think it's sold for like 40 dollars and maybe 38 probably 38 and um let's see uh, a few key points about vcrs where's my vcr notes i've lost them all right, guys, I'm right back with the VCR notes. So here we go. 
All right, Panasonic released the VCR models for home use in the 1970s and continued manufacturing the VCRs into the early 2000s. Early models included top-loading designs like the PV-1000 and front-loading designs like the PV-1270. By the 1980s, Panasonic VCRs were smaller, more lightweight, front-loading models with electric tuners and wireless remotes like the PV-1520. The clicker. I still call it the clicker. You call it the remote or the clicker. You know you call it the clicker. If you call it the clicker, you're a vintage. I called it the clicker the other day, and my daughter was like, what? I was like, like clicker. Give me the dang clicker. And my wife was like, remote. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm old. I'm vintage. What can I say? Um, matter of fact, this is, this is my Blockbuster t-shirt, so that says it all, right? Um, latest models added hi-fi stereo sound, multiple recording speeds, commercial skip functions, and other convenience features. High-end models included the Super VHS and a digital TBC, time-based correction for improved video quality. Panasonic used the uh, branding of the video cassette recorder or VCR and models rather than calling them VTRs, videotape recorders, which is what we I initially called them, videotape recorders. I remember that, like some other brands. Most hand on standard recording formats like VHS, SVHS, and VHS-C through Panasonic also made beta, beta, remember beta? That's old school. And many DVD, DVD format models. Typical inputs. All right. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting, though. I mean, who remembers going to Blockbuster? Oh, my gosh. A lot of memories. A lot of childhood memories. Anybody that, I don't know. What, what age do you guys think it would be if? that you were born when you were still using it. The DVDs came out in, what, 98, 99, when they got really, really popular. So I guess anything, anybody born in the 90s, really, you used VCR tapes, period. And it's just uh, memory. This is another thing that, just, I don't know. I do miss, I miss the uh, video stores. I know you guys miss them, too. It was a big mistake the way we all walked out on Blockbuster for Redbox. It was so cool at first. Then we realized, oh, my gosh, like 200 movies. Like, you know... It felt like blockbusters. They felt they had so many. It was so awesome. But anyway, all right, let's keep it moving. Uh, now this clock here, I didn't do any research because it wasn't anything I really could find solid for this company that produced this one. But this clock was like really awesome one. And then there's a story behind it, and I wanted to share it. I have a coworker. He's a very good man, and he had a, a mother-in-law that you know they're el she's elderly, and they the they they're down. They had to, she had to downsize, and he was cleaning out the house. Literally, just going into the house, throwing things into a dumpster. And he said, "Hey, I grabbed you some stuff. Um, it's in the trunk of my car." I was like, "All right." So I got the trunk of his car, and this is one of the items. But he he only he only had enough to fit in the trunk of his car. But the stuff was awesome. And then I was like, "What did you throw away?" <laughs> How much money did you throw away? Because, I mean, so it was like, it was so significant that I was like, here, I've got to give you money for this stuff. And he was like, no, no, it's for you. Like, no, I had to pay him some money for it. And, I mean, because the stuff he gave me was great. And this clock was one of them. Um, as you can see, it's one of those old spoke wall clocks, kind of star look. I think these were the 50s and the 60s, maybe 70s, maybe 70s and 60s. Um, but it, it's just, it just has that look. And it was just awesome. I had to list it. It was a little tricky for my wife to ship it, but um, I don't know. It was just weird. And he had given me like three Crocs, big one was a really big Croc, uh, jugs, uh, awesome postcards, like a bunch of them, like good ones that sold, been sold. Oh my gosh, he gave me so many cool items in the trunk of his car. Just amazes you what people throw out. Uh, they give to Goodwill, yard sales. Oh my gosh, but yeah, this this clock definitely. Um, yeah, it was a cool one. The uh, whole story behind it is cool. At least in my opinion. And there's a better picture of the clock right there. All right. And these lighters sold. Um, they weren't nothing special, but, you know, they were cool. You got an old table lighter here. You Just, just different trip, old AAA lighter right there. I believe M, L, M, that was cigarettes. Filters right there. But, yeah, the lighters were cool. They sold for $25.50. Here's a little bit better picture of them right there. All right, if you guys haven't hit that like button, please hit that like button. And leave a comment. I love chatting with you guys. It's absolutely awesome to chat with you. And check out my store. The link is below. Maybe you see something you like. Maybe you help a brother out. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Um, 
But yeah, there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. But anyway, thanks for um, joining me with this video. I will be pumping them out more often. And until next time, stay blessed. All right, guys. See you later.